haystack the size of Europe. And yet, needles turn up. In 1990, a British expedition journeyed to Niger to look for fossil fish in the Sahara. Paul Serino went along to look for dinosaurs. By sheer luck, he stumbled upon a field of bones, fossils sticking out of the ground as far as he could see. He dubbed it the dinosaur's graveyard. When he went back to dig it up, Serino found two completely new species. One was a fearsome carnivore Serino named Afrovenator, or African hunter. With its short arms and long teeth, Afrovenator resembled its famous North American cousin, T. rex, but only distantly. The other creature was a plant eater, its bones revealed it too had a cousin in North America, but there the similarity ended. It was as if Africa had its own breed of dinosaurs. One way to prove it was to find a new dinosaur in another part of the continent. In 1995, Serena went back. I've always been a, a rebel without a cause as a kid. I found a cause now that causes um, unearthing uh, really whole new chapters of uh, dinosaur life in Africa. One chapter remains unfinished. In 1954, the French paleontologist René Lavocat spent months wandering alone in Morocco searching for fossils. L'Avocat found only fragments of bones, but they belonged to a beast found nowhere else. He thought it might be a bizarre-looking meat-eater called Spinosaurus. German paleontologists had unearthed such a creature in Egypt in 1914. But in World War II, during an Allied raid on Munich, the bones were destroyed and Spinosaurus was once more extinct. Picking up Lavacar's cold trail, Paul Serino hopes to finish the job he started by finding an entirely new creature. Serino assembled his team in Chicago and flew to London where they picked up four Land Rovers, the vehicles that would get them through the desert. Then they began the trek across France and Spain toward their ultimate destination in Morocco. Never has so large an expedition been mounted to the Sahara. It took Serino almost a year to organize this joint Moroccan-American venture, planning the logistics, gathering the supplies, and most important, handpicking the team of 13, some professional, some amateur, but all enthusiastic. On a trip like this, endurance may count more than experience. In Spain, the team celebrate their last warm shower with cold beer. Here's to a reasonably complete sauropod with a skull. But not too heavy, with no ribs. <laughs> we have um, Gabriel Lyon, or Gabe. They call me Myasaurus, which means good mother. And so if I need to discipline them, it's not a problem. <laughs> then we have Hans Larsen, variously known as uh, what? Solo. 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 <laughs> Solo, who is a paleontologist. He also uh, is handling the vehicles and uh, lots of other things and, and, and is very interested in, 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 in helping describe and find the dinosaur. Didier Dutay, French paleontologist, uh, shark enthusiast, and uh, generally goes by the title of ambassador because uh, he, uh, he manages all complicated affairs. <laughs> Dave Riccio. Geologist and paleontologist, he's done a lot of dinosaur collecting. Chris Sidor, a young student, is along, uh, I think, for his first major effort in the field, getting a lot of field experience here. 
and uh, Paul McGuinney, one who has uh, also been on, on several field excursions and has a long view of reptile evolution, and so he's along to help us out in the field. Jeff Wilson, <laughs> who is our sauropod, the big dinosaur expert, who would love probably more than anyone else for us <laughs> to find one of these huge, huge beasts. Do we already toast to that? Let's do it. Why not? Sorry, Isn't that a good toast, man? <laughs> 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 Eleven days after setting out from London, the expedition reaches Tangiers in Africa. On the continent where mankind crawled out of prehistory, the origins of other species may yet emerge. At dawn, prayers from a hundred mosques awaken the medieval city of Fez. A bastion of Islam, Fez is also one big open air market. Monsieur? Combien pour litre? Uh, pour kilo. Kilo. kilo? kilo. Okay. <laughs> this morning, Gabriel, Jeff, and Dave are hunting bargains, not fossils. Oh no no! Oh yeah! yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the price. <laughs> That's the, the Land Rovers will carry more than a ton of food, around 70 kilograms per person. Almost 200 kilos of pasta, 50 kilos of rice. 10 kilos of oatmeal, 7 kilos of cereal bars, 2 kilos of cinnamon, 1 kilo of garlic powder, 400 tea bags, 600 fruit bars, 96 rolls of toilet paper. Good day. What? We're having another dirham here. Okay. Okay. Everything from tomatoes to beef, from milk to cheese, is dried. <laughs> the fresh fruit and vegetables bought today will be the last they see for a long time. They'll be gone for two months. Serino's hopes of finding a new dinosaur rest partly on a creature known only by name, the Egyptian find called Spinosaurus. A carnivore like no other, it hints that on the path of evolution, Africa's dinosaurs took a detour. The biggest and best clue is, is Spinosaurus from Egypt. It's a, uh, a huge uh, predator. And we don't know that much about it, but what we have tells us it's very strange. It's got backbone with very high spines that uh, held a sail. Spinosaurus, or thorn lizard, thrived 100 million years ago. 12 meters long, it was the strangest of all the flesh eaters, with spines rising almost two meters from its backbone, and a long jaw with teeth like steak knives. It probably used its sail to control its body temperature. Under the midday sun, it shed heat through thin blood vessels. On cool mornings, it turned its sail towards the sun to warm up. If Africa could produce such a strange predator, perhaps it harbored an entire continent of curiosities. There's um, the history of, of tantalizing clues to what uh, life on Africa might have been like. We know that when the continents were connected, uh, the animals uh, were a little bit more similar, uh, at some points a lot more similar. And we know that uh, we have some clues that Africa uh, really was on its own, its own path. 250 million years ago, all the continents were bunched together in one supercontinent called Pangaea, where dinosaurs mingled freely. 
Africa started to drift away 150 million years ago, near the end of the Jurassic. By 130 million years ago, Africa had finally broken free. So had its dinosaurs. Isolated in a hothouse the size of a continent, nature began to experiment with the bizarre. And so we have the idea that uh, possibly on different islands, continents, uh, a whole different kinds of animals came into being. It looks like at least the predators and possibly the herbivores had gone off on their own. And uh, how different and bizarre these animals are is what we're really trying to narrow down. How did the isolation at a continent level affect dinosaur evolution? We think something different was happening here. In the search for the dinosaurs that no one else has found, the greatest risk in the hostile Sahara may be to reputations. Where failure leads, few will follow. If Sereno's team turns up nothing, they may close the book on Africa's dinosaurs before the first chapter is even written. and 40 kilometers south of Fez, the dinosaur hunters of Africa hit a snag. A flat tire isn't their first hurdle, and it won't be their last. We're gonna be out there, the temperature's gonna get to 120, 130, uh, it's going to be dusty. We don't have places to take showers. We've got to cook our own food and go out every day and work 12, 15-hour days. You have to have a certain amount of uh, vision, faith, and, and youthfulness to, to be able to handle that. Three hours from their destination, the expedition reaches the end of the road and the village of Telsint. A caravan has never passed through here, at least not one without camels. Telsint proves of equal interest. Recently, we've heard that there's been a sauropod, part of a sauropod skeleton located somewhere in the area. So it looks good for at least there being bone out here and there being um, animals for us to find. To find fossils, fossil hunters look for rocks as old as the dinosaurs, 100 million years old. Armed with the report of Moroccan geologists who are aiding his expedition, Serino decides to make a side trip to a place called Anwal. Luckily, we have the geologists who are working on the, on the geologic map of Anwal, so um, it should be a little easier for us to, to get, a, get a handle on where the rocks are and, and where those beds are that we're looking for. And, well, of course, I'd like to find a sauropod. I mean, anytime you ask me that, I'm gonna say sauropod. There are few regions in the Sahara where rocks as old as the dinosaurs are exposed. Anwal is one of them. It lies almost 500 kilometers southeast of Fez in the foothills of the Atlas Mountains. Serino's predecessors in Morocco have mostly been loners who wandered in and out of the Sahara. Men like the nomadic Frenchman, Lavacar, who may have held in his hands the only bones of a beast found nowhere else. Whether he did remains a mystery. First fossils were discovered 40 years ago, and no team has been in there yet. And so we're thrilled to be the first team in there. There's a lot of interest in this area. We got here first. For the next week, the team will try its hand in Anwal. The first task is deciding where to look. If you climb this ridge, you see a really long sort of tongue coming down. So maybe that's this ridge here? Yeah, that's probably that. Okay. 
people can have collecting bags. We'll have some collecting bags. And we, we're going to try and establish some names if we find a, places where there's certain amounts of bones and we'll satellite locate them. We're going to try and keep within sight of each other. And so we get the feel of these beds. Some fragments of dinosaur bone have been found in them and some mammal teeth have been found in them. And it's about four or 500 meters thick. That's a big thickness before you get to another thickness before you get to the limestone. There's about 15 miles and it gets narrower as we go down. So we'll see what we can cover today. More and more there's evidence that uh, there are fossils here in Morocco. We know that there are fossils here, but actually getting there with the right team, with the right amount of energy, and the ability to cover large areas uh, of this part of the Sahara is the grand trick. Do you want to come up here? Yep. I'm looking for my hand. You could use your field oh, knife to hide it. <laughs> we're going to go over there together until we actually decide, uh, you know, that we're in the right age bed, right? Before we split off everything. The team is standing on rocks 100 million years old, but finding fossils among them is like panning for gold, mostly a matter of luck and sweat. Whether the earth will yield any fossils at all depends on the earth's condition. It seems pretty flat going through. Since the days of the dinosaurs, the land has literally undergone a sea change. Today, this is a cool, windswept desert. 90 million years ago, anything that moved here was swimming, and the land was underwater. You can see the striation so that it is rough. 100 million years ago, the water was confined to lakes and swamps. But is there another depositional there, like, like something else stuck on there? Because you can see it on the edge there. But Few dinosaurs ever had the chance to become fossils. The bones of most were eaten away by the elements. Perhaps only one in a million was ever preserved. I think that prospecting for fossils is um, a lot of hard work. <laughs> you can. Uh, uh, look here and the fossils there and you don't see it that part's luck yeah. but that you're looking in this area in the first place has to do with the fact that you've interpreted a map correctly that you've gone to the outcrop saw a bad one went to a good one you make hundreds of decisions like this in the course of a field season and if you have some idea of what the rocks are telling you about the environment then you, you stand choose. a much better chance of finding fossils it's like it has more to do with um, understanding rocks <laughs> Even when the earth yields no fossils, it yields clues. First, you can find a fossil. That's the best clue. But if you don't find the fossil, uh, then you can look at the environments to see, well, do we look more, or is this, there's something, clues here telling us that fossils aren't here. One of the fastest ways to tell what kind of sediment you're dealing with is just to taste it and chew it for a while. Because with just one or two bites, you can determine how much grit is in a piece of sediment. It's a little gritty, but no, very, of, very, very slight. Just a touch, touch of yeah. In turn, the sediment reveals the nature of the land, whether it was once a forest, riverbed, lake bottom, or desert. The soil is embedded with gypsum, a common mineral that originates in salt lakes. When the water dries up, gypsum remains behind. This is... Uh, really a beautifully thick layer. This is about maybe six inches thick. Uh, one down the hill is, is almost uh, a meter thick, and, and that's the most gypsum I've ever seen in my life. It's a bad sign. If there's gypsum in the soil, there would have been salt in the water. Every lake and swamp would have been briny, unfit to drink. We're looking at a, a hostile environment to, to life in general and to preservation of fossils. We're an animal to wander into the area and keel over. Uh, likely chance that the sediment is coming down so slow that it's going to rot. It will be taken up by scavengers long before it would ever have the chance of being covered. 
What you want is an environment, a higher energy environment where the, the, the soil has typically has more sand in it and comes over and covers over something, a carcass very quickly and preserves it uh, as a fossil. The team finds a few marine fossils, but no dinosaurs. After seven disappointing days in Anwal, they head south to a region in Morocco called the Kemkem. -Kem. It lies near the Algerian border, a hazy area still in dispute, as surreal as the landscape itself. Leaving the chilly Atlas Mountains, they enter one of the hottest regions on Earth, a place with few plants, few people, few signs of life. There's a, a certain aura about the Sahara um, because there's so little known. And a vastness uh, that you get when you enter the Sahara, which you don't get anywhere else in the world. Um, it's awe-inspiring when you're in the field and you realize how much of this land has never been walked before. One of the few to walk it, René Lavocat, managed to conjure a beast from a few fragments of bone. Lavaca may have glimpsed a new creature, or only a mirage. After three weeks, Serino's expedition draws near its destination, the Kemkem. -Kem. There lies the last hope of finding what they've come for, proof that Africa's dinosaurs are a breed apart. Their base camp is at Taos, a tiny outpost on the Algerian border. Year round, it's inhabited by Berbers, occasionally by Tuaregs, the true nomads of the desert. For two months, the fossil hunters will live like the Tuareg, crisscrossing the Sahara in the wake of strange beasts found nowhere else on Earth, creatures older than time. The Sahara is the world's largest desert and one of the hottest places on Earth. Temperatures soar to 130 degrees. One fifth of it is sand, the rest is rock. Most of it is barren. The Sahara has the highest evaporation rate in the world. When the sun is highest and the humidity lowest, life shrinks from the heat. There are few roads in the Sahara, and the fossil trail is faint. It begins in the twilight before the First World War. In 1914, German paleontologists digging in Egypt found the bones of a strange new meat-eater with a huge fin on its back. In the Second World War, this sole specimen was bombed out of existence. Ten years later, across the desert in Morocco, a French paleontologist turned up fragments of another new creature. Yet from this point of the Sahara, no complete skeleton has ever emerged. In 1990, in yet another part of the desert, Paul Serino stumbled upon two new species of dinosaur. Seized by Africa fever, he picks up the dinosaur trail in Morocco. There's such a lore about this part of the Sahara with the early finds. I thought that bone might be more plentiful. It would be easier to find fossils than it actually was. And uh, after about two weeks of being in the desert, we understood the odds we were against, which was that it was going to be quite difficult to actually walk out of here 
with uh, some new dinosaurs. On this limestone cliff, the first difficulty is simply walking at all. You're talking hiking hundreds of feet each day, 110, 115 degree temperature. And it's that kind of faith and belief that carried people. But walking in limestone all day, you sort of rip your, rip your feet up, just blisters, um, sore feet, that sort of thing. It's incredible how hot it really gets. And, and you go through a tremendous amount of water each day. The worst has been the, the sandstorm, windstorm that blow in. Night after night, they return to camp, foot sore and empty handed. They have found hints of a dozen new dinosaurs, but no dinosaur itself. Following a faint trail, Sereno is guided by beasts that haven't stirred for a hundred million years. The days grow longer, the time runs short. For 40 days and nights, they comb the desert. Then, on the 41st day, they close in. Well, in the morning, it started out on a wrong foot. Literally, uh, one of my boots had been plunged into water. And so we opened up the truck, and it was time to go prospecting. And I decided to prospect in one boot and one sandal and had spent the day with a little bit of trepidation on every rock. It came time to go back for lunch. And I said to Jeff, I said, oh, I'll, I'll meet you at the truck, so I'm going to go the long way around. It's easier to get down. Gabrielle, uh, all of a sudden, uh, didn't come back for lunch on time, and we got very worried. On the way, I stumbled over a, an incredible find. <laughs> at the time, I didn't, I didn't know it. And uh, we went running out to find a finder after uh, almost an hour had passed. I saw one bone, I saw another bone, and I was trying to get them, and I knew I was gonna be late for lunch. And we eventually did find her, and she came down with these strange bones. And they were running around calling my name, going, Gabe, and I'm like, I'm fine, I'm, I'm okay. After a dormant eternity, a dinosaur had re-emerged. What it was, the team didn't yet know. Perhaps a single animal, or several. Perhaps intact? or incomplete. It might be the same bizarre beast that turned up once before in the Sahara, then vanished. Or it might be something entirely new. The big bits of Matrix. The fossil hunters have uncovered a carnivore and a mystery. It takes five days in all to prize free each delicate bone. The team then wraps the fossils in foil, tucking it into every cranny so no fragments are jarred loose. Next, they wrap strips of burlap dipped in plaster around the bones. Once hard, it will form a jacket to protect them on the long journey to the lab. See that board stays on. Already they have a rare find. The bones are arranged just as they were when the beast died. Good job. Great, stay on there. What kind of beast it was, no one knew until Paul Serino began to put it together. It was midnight of that long, long day that I went into the uh, shelter that we had uh, the bones stored in and I picked up the first fragment and put it right into place on one of the other pieces. Uh, as the hours passed, my eyes were just, really, I, I was, I just couldn't believe what was being assembled in front of me. Four in the morning, Paul came over to my cot and was like, Gabe, Gabe. I was tears in my eyes, I said, y you don't know what we've discovered. I discovered something absolutely incredible. Hi, You're never gonna believe it. What we were seeing was a map of a single skeleton, a very strange one. I had a very important announcement to the crew. I assembled them all. I started telling them that they were the greatest crew because they'd put up with uh, an incredible uh, season. Not a single one of them was down. And I said, you, you know, and I started crying in front of them. And I said, you, you will not believe what we have begun to discover here. Uh, come and see. Before I left that room at 4 a.m., uh, I had the, the bones all organized anatomically, shoulder girdle, pelvic girdle, limbs, and so on. I mixed them all up. 
and I wanted to give them the opportunity to, to put it together. And I, I, I said, you won't believe what we have discovered. It, it's in there. It's incredible. And if you want to piece together the pieces yourself, and they said, no, show us. You know, we went running in and put the pieces back in order. In the field, the team thought they had dug up another spinosaur, the sail-backed oddity unearthed in Egypt. But the bones didn't fit. They moved one bone and realized they were looking at a shoulder blade. Into its socket fit a very small arm bone. They deduced that their new carnivore was fast-legged and short-armed, like its larger cousin, T. rex. Still, its nearest relative was very distant. They had found a dinosaur found nowhere else on Earth. Cause for celebration. are long and the day starts early. The team rises with the sun around 5 a.m. They'll work until sundown, except for a reprieve at noon when the sun burns brightest. After a day on the jagged limestone ridge, they start each morning with an obligatory ritual boot mending. Most of the team has resorted to gluing strips of truck tire to their soles. I think this is the last time I ever go on an expedition with only one pair of boots. Each day, the team uncovers more pieces of Africa's ancient puzzle and another mystery. The biggest animals that we get here. The big, the big huge crack. Huge teeth, four to five inches long from a giant carnivore, yet no other traces of it have turned up. What has turned up are traces of other humans, fossil poachers. Hans Larsen and Paul McGuenny discover that someone has dug here before them. Every day, it's like we, we walk for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and just come to stuff like this. Yeah, these are, these are caves dug by uh, illegal fossil hunters in the area. And if you look down the, the length of the hill, they're everywhere. Some of these are really deep, too. Like, like this one here is almost 12 feet deep. They channel and dig out whatever they can. Yeah, I mean, it's a pity because, I mean, they're only getting small, small little things, and unfortunately, it's illegal. So, so look at these tools that they're using. Just pretty rough pickaxes. This looks pretty good. Spades. And they just, they just dig, dig in under these, oh, under the okay. sediment here. It's hard to break new ground when the soil has been picked over. We're the first team to come here to try and get the whole view in place, as it were. Some pieces of that puzzle have been picked up, and we'll never know where they fit in. We'll probably never know what they actually were, because they were sold uh, uh, on a market and went somewhere, and we'll never see them again. In Morocco, it's legal to sell common fossils, but not dinosaurs. Such treasures often end up abroad in the hands of private collectors, beyond the reach of science. Tonight, the team savors another treasure, fresh salad, a commodity as precious as fossils since the nearest market is four hours away. Mm. That's going to be good. That's, I think we'll be a little more crayon those. Let's go. Dinner is served. Yeah. <laughs> Mushroom. Mm, a little bit of spice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Working magic in the field. What, what's in this pot? A soup? Soup. soup. For and meat. That's like, that's like meat. Oh, it's very meaty. I wish it was meat. Looks like meat. <laughs> we can pretend. This day ends as it began, with another ritual, and a vital one, fetching water. The nearest well is four miles away. Berber women make the same journey on foot. 
Every few days, the team refills its water cans, 300 litres worth. Each member drinks more than seven litres a day. Showers are only an occasional luxury, taken on the spot and consisting of an upended bucket. Falling asleep under the stars, some see visions of a monster. The big-toothed predator that eludes them by day now stalks their dreams. After seven weeks, the team has found only the tip of an iceberg, the huge teeth of a flesh-eating dinosaur. Paul Serino sets out to find the dinosaur itself. We still had uh, a couple days left in the field. We moved to one of the last areas we had to look. This time I was the lucky one, and it was totally unpredictable. I saw an area of outcrop. I walked towards it, and I walked over, and I saw in front of me a pile of bones, fragments. I picked this thing up, looked at the upside down side, and my eyes popped out of my head. Here we had the back end of a theropod skull, beautifully preserved flesh-eating carnivorous dinosaur. Of course, always fingers crossed, I mean, maybe this was part of something else that was just above somewhere, but it was quite sheer. And I missed it the first time. And I circled around again, and that's when I saw, I looked up, and I saw on a pillar of rock the rest of the, the brain case and the skull going into the side of this cliff. And it was a sheer cliff, and it was sort of like a little statue sitting up there. And my, again, this was too much, I mean. <laughs> Wow, oh, this cheekbone is really huge. Wow, the preservation is, is magnificent. Look at this. We had been tracking it earlier in the season, and we often joked about finding it. And we joked, there is some whopping big animal, you know, carnivore, uh, in this formation. And so we've tracked that thing for uh, 100 miles before we finally found it. So this would be the nose area here? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, this is the left. So it's been put over there. So here's the other nostril right here. Yeah. I'm digging in the nose right now. But at about 45 degrees. That's going to be great. Make sure that it holds the lip. Mm. Look at this. Have you guys seen the teeth? This is incredible. One, two, three. There's a replacing tooth here. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We got the whole jaw. Five, six, eight, ten. I mean, it wouldn't have really had more than 14 teeth. Mm -hmm. And here's some more. Each one. Alveoli. Yeah. This would have been one mean creature. Jaws. I wouldn't worry about other bones sticking out from under. You basically have the whole skull. We've got cheek, nose bones, side bones there, orbit bones, and brain case back there. We've got the whole skull. Yeah. The skull was huge, one and a half meters long. It's not just the largest predator any of them have found. It's the most complete skull of a dinosaur ever found in Africa. The jaws were narrow and studded with blade-like teeth. Judging from marks on the teeth, the beast crunched through bone, making it the greatest predator of its day. If I ever imagined myself alive with one of the creatures that we're excavating, I always imagine myself hiding, but I'd, I'd give an arm to see the thing alive. It would be absolutely fantastic, um, even if that arm was taken by the dinosaur. <laughs> As always, before moving their find, the team cushions it in tinfoil and plaster. Water, burlap, and plaster must all be lugged 150 meters up the cliff. The ordeal will take three days. By the fourth day, the plaster is dry. Okay, okay. see if you can right. slide it. On the count of three. One, One two, two, three. three. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I got it. One, two, easy go. Oh. Okay. Oh. 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 
Okay. Slide, slide the bottom. Pull yourself up. There you go. Okay. Very good. Woo. Got it. Now begins the journey down the cliff with their precious prize. The rock around the skull and the plaster around the rock, their big find now weighs 135 kilograms. Along the cliffside, limestone rubble makes the going unpredictable, but the team is unflappable. You can't imagine a better team. A team that sticks together, has fun, works incredibly hard with shredded boots, patched pants. They're ready to, to go the extra. Uh, 10 miles uh, in the heat, and, I, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, a part of it. Well, we'll, we'll drop it right in front of the truck, okay. right? Ready? One, two, three. You gotta give it a little bit of height. Okay, you gotta get it. I gotta get out of the way. Good. Okay, good. This is low. You got it? Oh, it fits perfect. Great. The team heads back to camp with its second new dinosaur. It could take a year to clean the bones. Till then, we can only guess how this beast looked. We know it was a meat eater. It had a huge skull, 13 centimeter long teeth, and three clawed arms. Perhaps 15 meters long, it was almost as big as the notorious T-Rex. Yet it was a creature apart. The dinosaurs found in Morocco suggest that in the course of evolution, Africa blazed its own trail. In this isolated hothouse thrived species found nowhere else. Yet ultimately, they went the way of all such creatures. Chassis. Making their way back to camp for the last time, the team gets stuck. It's as if the Sahara doesn't wish to let them go. Leaving the field behind, the team returns to base camp in Taos. After two months in the desert, they relish the comforts of home. Before I get back to the States, mm. at the first opportunity is a properly cold, really, really good beer. <laughs> Juicy steak, some corn on the cob. Be good. Some mashed potatoes. Yeah, definitely be steak. Good. That would be my bet. That would be my guess. Yeah. And the second thing I want is is a second beer. <laughs> really, really cold. Cool. <laughs> really good. I think omelet. Hot chicken wings. Yeah. A very fresh champagne. Glasses and glasses of beer mixed with wine and beer and wine and beer and wine. Chocolate milkshake with whipped cream. Put up there right now. In Chicago, the bones will be copied, studied, and finally returned to Morocco. Actually, it looks like it's best to go all the way to Uzina. <laughs> Leaving the Sahara, Paul Serino and his team end one journey and start another, back into time to map the uncharted past of ancient Africa. What is that thing? It's terribly thrilling to pull off these adventures in Africa. When you meet the challenge with a young group like this and succeed, it's one of those rare moments in life. And 
life is short. I never expected to be so dramatic, so hard, so difficult, and so rewarding. And uh, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. We're going to be back, I hope, next year, uh, trying to do it again. Friday night's programs on Discovery Channel continue with Justice Files.